right, my little sweet potatoes, the day that we've been simultaneously dreading and dreaming of is finally here. Our favorite show has ended, and even though I'm heartbroken that we don't have any more new Owl House episodes to look forward to, I'm so grateful for how much happiness this series has given all of us. The Owl House is really a show that makes you feel seen, no matter what kind of weirdo you are. I never wanted this series to end, but this finale has way too much for us to talk about for me to not be excited. I'm taking you through the ending of the final episode, Watching and Dreaming, to explain how Luz ultimately defeated Belos and where the Hexide gang ended up after graduation. You're watching Whitney Vision, and this is the ending of The Owl House Explained. This is your spoiler warning! Seriously, this is the worst episode in the history of episodes to have spoiled for you, so close Twitter, hit pause on this video, and come back when you're done watching and dreaming. Just a heads up, we're going to be doing a full in-depth frame-by-frame breakdown on the entire episode later in the week, so stay tuned. But for now, let's briefly go over the ending and get into the nitty-gritty of the epilogue. Despite the fact that the Bad Girl Coven empathetically worked together to help the Collector understand kindness and forgiveness, Bellos was still a lost cause. He dragged his sludge all the way to the Titan's heart, where he face-planted straight into it infecting the still-beating Morgan. Unfortunately, the Bad Girl Coven's powers, and even the Collector's forgiveness, weren't enough to stop his souped-up powers, and his horrifying, beastly dragon form ends up infecting Luz with his rot. Like Anne Boonjoy before her, Luz ends up dying temporarily from Belos's curse, teaching the Collector the bittersweet lesson of sacrifice and loss. Although it appears that her body dissolves into floating balls of light, Luz somehow travels to the realm in between, where Papa Titan scoops her out of the darkness before she descends for good. When she opens her eyes, King's dad is standing before her, obviously rocking some sweet, sweet BCG merch, along with a pair of glyph-printed pajama bottoms. If the Mystery Shack is listening, please, please make those a reality. The fans need comfy Titan PJs. We also got confirmation that the Titan is in fact gender fluid, as he refers to himself as a king and queen, the best of both worlds. Before he's fully taken over by Belos and fades away for good, King's dad imbues Luz with the last of his powers, encouraging her to choose herself by accepting. After adorably telling Luz to tell King that he loafs him, the perfect bread pun, he disappears and Luz is transported back to the Isles to confront Belos. With her sick new powers, Titan makeover, and the support and guidance of King Ida and Stringbean, Luz is able to kick that a-hole's hiney to next Tuesday, healing the Isles and stopping the Emperor's reign of terror for good. Although Philip Wittebane tries to appeal to Luz's humanity in his old-school meat suit, Ida, Rain, and King give him the stomping he deserves. Kindness and forgiveness are great, but so are King's cute little kickies! Side quest, we'll definitely talk about it way more in the full breakdown, but how badass is Luz's anime Hot Topic look? I'm never getting over how cool it is. I think I know what all of our Halloween costumes are going to be this year, folks. Sadly, when the Titan leaves Luz, his magic dies with him, removing all traces of his glyphs from the Boiling Isles. In her bittersweet triumph, Luz takes a moment to reflect on the importance of the glyph's magic in her life, and attributing it as being a foundational element in her growth. In a lot of ways, this is metaphorical for the show itself, and storytelling in a wider sense. Like Azura for Luz or the Owl House for us, stories can become formative parts of our being, helping us discover pieces of ourselves in ways the day-to-day -day world around us doesn't foster or worse, actively suppresses. When you fall in love with a piece of media, it's like learning a new language. Obviously, fandom spaces can be a mixed bag, but the best parts of a fandom? That's finding others that speak your language. Personally, that's one of the reasons I love making videos so much. At times, it feels like being an anthropologist, trying to dust off fragmented pieces to a Rosetta Stone that's the key for a language no one truly knows how to speak yet. Coming here and sharing my thoughts and theories and translations and then hearing everyone else's is a spark in the darkness at times. And once you spend long enough learning the shorthand and lingo of a story, you have the tools to share and create subculture with like-minded weirdos. Weirdos you can send inside jokes to, or write fanfiction with, or make games for. There are so many wonderful moving cogs to this series, but one of my favorites, and perhaps the one least talked about, is the Owl House's love for fan culture. It's a core theme in the pilot, it's a catalyst to Lumity's relationship, and in many ways, it's the reason the show works so well. We wouldn't have all those hidden codes or intriguing character mysteries without a production team that loves storytelling from the perspective of being fans who love storytelling. So here, 
For Lou's The Owl House crew and for us fans, the Titan's magic ending signifies the end of a chapter in our little communities and lives. We've become experts in a dying field. It's not the end of the world, but it is sad knowing that there's nothing new to learn and that the comfort we were once afforded by wild magic will fade over time. The important lesson here is to carry what we've learned about ourselves and the friendships we've made from this little story forward as the next chapters in our lives unfold. And as we can see at the end of the episode, there will always be new stories and languages to learn as time marches on. Despite having finally made their first real friends in King and Luz, the Collector decides to return to the stars. But of course they don't go alone. King ends up gifting the Collector his beloved Francois and tells them that he hopes he sees them again soon. But now let's talk about what we really came here to talk about. The incredible epilogue that the Owl House crew clearly poured so much love and effort into. It begins with Luz packing up all of her Good Witch Azura merch, mirroring the beginning of the series when she felt obligated to gather up all of her most prized possessions and say goodbye. But with all the weirdo acceptance she's learned over the past several years, of course it's completely different now. She's packing them up to take to college with her, something that Andy clearly didn't know was an option in Toy Story 3. In addition to her Azura merch, we can see her Grom Queen crown, Tamagotchi, Ida's Letterman jacket, and a scroll with a red seal. I'm wondering if this scroll might be the prophecy from Adagash she received back in the second episode, although I'm not sure why she'd keep that. Perhaps as a reminder that she's in control of her destiny? On her desk, we see Luz's acceptance letter to the University of Wild Magic, and she'll be moving into dorm room 406B on August 21st. Her desk shows her and Amity's initials carved in the upper right-hand corner and her to-buy list for college includes a laptop, sheets, a laundry bin, and an umbrella to combat those pesky boiling raindrops. On her bulletin board, Luz has a Gravesfield Ghouls flag from her human high school, a photo of her and V hugging at graduation held up by a bisexual flag heart pin, and a certificate for the Gravesfield Writing Scholarship signed by none other than creator Dana Terrace. There's also an A-plus on a writing assignment with a sticker of Polly from Amphibia at the top, as well as tickets to Comic-Con and a 3D showing of the new Azura movie. But obviously, the photos she has hanging are the best part. We get to see tiny snapshots of her life over the last three years, including the coffee barista from yesterday's lie who might lose a hand feeding Hootie, Luz, Camilla, and V at the zoo with those terrifying giraffes, King, Ida, and Luz on Grom Night, Ida and Camilla doing some mom bonding over glasses of apple blood, Luz with Amity stargazing on the roof of the Owl House, a team photo of the Emerald Entrails with Flapjack, a light glyph, King, Ida, and Hootie playing baseball, and a photo from a more recent Grom that features the whole gang. In the corner of Luz's bedroom, we can see String Bean's little sleeping quarters, complete with a mouse chew toy. Camilla, who is still adorably rocking her heart-shaped pride pin all these years later, asks Luz to help her wrap some Maduros a sweet fried plantain dish. Luz reveals that, true to her character, she's choosing to major in everything in college, just like she did when she decided to study multiple tracks in her early days at Hexide. The majors available at the University of Wild Magic include Ancient Glyphs and Combos, which, to be fair, she's already kind of a specialist in, Boiling Isles History, Boiling Biology, Thaumaturgy, which historically means miracle performing but probably just means general magic casting in this case, Abomination Engineering, Curses 101, and etc. Betcha 10 bucks that if you actually unfurled the full list of Luz's majors, it would be longer than the collector's favorite bedtime story. Luz's new, more grown-up design features the striped shirt from her beta design, as well as a sick jacket stylized with a snake wrapping around it to represent string bean. With that new, more androgynous haircut paired with the colors of her purple and white shirt, the golden color of her pants, and her white, black, purple, and yellow shoes, I wonder if this is a hint that Luz may identify as non-binary now. Although her outfit features colors from the non-binary flag, as of writing this, it hasn't been confirmed by the staff and I don't want to make assumptions about the way that Luz identifies, so I'm going to keep using the pronouns she, her. She's also wearing Amity's necklace and has several patches on her pants featuring the potions, bard, abomination, and combo glyph magic symbols, most likely sewed on by Hunter. Speaking of Hunter, Luz also got a tattoo on her left bicep to commemorate Flapjack, and we find out shortly after that the rest of the Hexide gang has gotten one too. V's new time hop look shows her wearing a t-shirt that represents her two homes, the human world and the demon realm. Later on in the epilogue, we learn that this is the symbol for the human and demon realm exchange program. Behind her, we can see a photo of String Bean dressed as a cute little pumpkin for Halloween, as well as a pic of V and Luz celebrating a win on the baseball field. 
And surprise, that old house in the woods was not only purchased and refurbished once again, this time by Camilla, but a brand new full-time portal has been installed. My guess is that the collector did this for them the next time he stopped by the aisles to say hi to King. We follow Albert into the demon realm, mirroring the way we first discovered the entrance to the boiling aisles with Luz all the way back in episode one. Albert meets up with Willow in the sky, who's wearing an emerald on trails jersey, clutching a green flyer derby flag as she and Clover head to find Hunter, who, oh yeah, is totally her boyfriend now. Huntlow confirmed, baby! It also turns out that one of my finale predictions was right. Hunter ends up becoming a palisman carver, working alongside Del, Gwendolyn, and of course the Bat Queen and her children, who also each developed their own unique style since we last saw them. Not gonna lie, they look exactly like the people that I went to Warp Tour with back in 2007. Hunter is carving an axolotl palisman for a more grown-up Braxis, who now has braces and is rocking colors from both the healing and construction tracks of magic. Like Caleb Wittabane before him, Hunter's decided to become a woodworker. And we also get what I think is pretty strong evidence that he's also related to the Clawthorns, because it seems like he's taking over the family business from Dell. Back in thanks to them, Hunter proclaimed that all he wanted to do was carve palismen as he was rejecting Bellos' mind control. And his career choice is also clearly a lifelong dedication to the memory of Flapjack. Some of the other palismen he's carved include a capybara, a toucan, a worm, a sloth, a frog, a manta ray, an anglerfish, and a hamster with devil horns. Keeping with the Clawthorn's bird theme, Hunter even has a new palismen, a blue jay that Dana confirmed on Twitter is named Waffles. And y'all, Hunter looks so well rested these days. The dark circles under his eyes have disappeared, and it's so wholesome to see that he's finally at peace. He's also advanced a lot in his style. Our guy is rocking patches head to toe, and judging by the looks of the rest of his friends' clothing, my guess is that he's also been sprucing up their wardrobes with his sewing. I'm so sorry, but I just have to take a second to say that I've never seen a cartoon with the exact same favorite hobby as me. And these last three episodes featuring Hunter's patches and wolf shirts have made me feel so seen. I also force patch jackets on all of my friends as gifts. It's literally the only thing I do in my free time. Hunter's patches include an abomination symbol for Darius, an illusion symbol for his best buddy Gus, and the Emerald Entrails logo to support Willow. His red shoes feature gold lightning bolts to represent the speedy teleporting powers he received from Flapjack. Hunter was most likely the originator for the idea to get Flapjack tattoos. And unlike the rest of his friends who place their tattoos on the left sides of their bodies, Hunter has his etched on his right wrist in place of his old coven sigil. This is truly the most fitting cover-up tattoo, because in the end, Bellos and the Emperor's coven were never his family. But Flapjack was actually everything to Hunter Bellos claimed to be. Willow and Hunter pay their respects at Flapjack's gravesite, and y'all, I could not stop crying when I read the inscription on his tombstone. It says, thank you for finding me. And all I could think about was how truly different things would have been if his little red cardinal buddy had never shown up for him. Flapjack was ultimately able to do what no one else could at the time, teach Hunter the real meaning of compassion and unconditional love outside of Bellos' manipulations. Flying over the Bonesboro Marketplace, we see an older Morton, the potions dealer, as well as Basha running a Grudgeby gear shop. Matholomew's Mantholomew stash is still trying its best, and he even has a cool S tattoo, finally solving the mystery of who put up that graffiti in For the Future. Some fans have pointed out that Mytholomew's older brother is Steve, who he looks up to dearly, so this could be an S in honor of his bro. Also, that makes the S graffiti so much more sad. Little dude was just trying to find his brother in the collector's chaos. Mytholomew's head of construction renovation for the library, and apparently Kikimura is now working as his subordinate. The outside of the library now features a large circular stained glass window that appears to represent the collector with respect to their complicated history and reconciliation. Lilith is head librarian, and she unfurls her plans for adding a museum wing, complete with handy reminders scribbled on like, space for student exhibits, must call bump, and note to self, write to Flora to show off. Speaking of Flora, recently revealed behind the scenes art from Hollow Minds confirms that Bellos had been using Flora to manipulate Lilith all along. In happier news, Lilith has finally gotten a place to show off her love of Deadwardian era balusters, her big project from Elsewhere and Elsewhen. Of course, this section will be curated by none other than Hootsifer. The library will also have a hall for Titan research, and while Brett thinks that the note at the bottom left-hand corner is supposed to say, discover blank with blankety blank, maybe, I chose to read it as disco with blank, maybe. Who does Lilith want to disco with? Wrong answers in the comments only. A few moments later, we also see that Lilith has made peace with her half of her and her sister's shared curse too, and can transform into a harpy just like Ida. 
Amity arrives in a cat-shaped abomination air balloon ship, a callback to the way that Luz reshaped her family's abomination butler in escaping expulsion. Our favorite cotton candy-haired goddess appears to be some kind of badass Indiana Jones Laura Croft-esque adventurer mashup, collecting important artifacts for Lilith's exhibits. The book she brings back looks to be further lore about the archivists and titans, as well as information about how the titan bestowed wild magic to which kind. Amity's flapjack tattoo is on her left forearm, and she's also gotten a really cool undercut that shows her brown hair peeking out from underneath her purple ponytail. She has multiple pieces of Grom Queen Tierra shards holding her hair back, and my question is, did she just win every Grom nom for the rest of her high school career? At the newly rebuilt Hexide, we find Skara showing her bard skills off by playing the harp for a group of young demons. At the time I'm writing this, I'm not sure if any of these little guys are meant to be depictions of TOH crew members, but that tiny fluff is too specific not to be a crew member's cutie. In the next shot, though, we can see a confirmed witch Sona of production associate Rebecca Rose leaning out the window with a smoking vase. It turns out that Barkus is her professor, teaching her a combination of plant, abomination, and potion magic. It also looks like the former healing track teacher, Miss Jenkinmeyer, has been promoted to school principal. She welcomes a student that looks exactly like the show's creator, Dana Terrace, complete with a shark tattoo on her arm and an owl house pin on her beanie. Little Dana is also rocking the colors of the former Abomination and Construction Covens, which is extremely fitting for the world builder of this freaky demon show we've come to love so much. Bump looks like he's retired, or at least partially retired, as he tends to his garden. In previous episodes, he's joked about only being 300 years away from retirement, but after being turned into a puppet for the Collector, I can see why he decided to move on sooner than expected. On his apron, you can also see a little hootie flower patch, and I'd bet a million snails that Hunter sewed it on for him. Alador Blight is finally using his abomination invention powers for good, helping a group of healers at a hospital in Latissa, including Gerbo, Bo, Viney, and Emmer, reverse Bellos' forced coven sigil seals. Rain, Darius, and Eber are also here supervising, and Darius is so excited that he shakes Alador to celebrate their excess. This feels like a strong hint that these two cuties have a flirtation ship, possibly stemming from their former days as classmates at Hexide. Alador's also wearing three pins on his apron to represent Edric, Emmer, and Amity, and he has a little guy abomination right in his pocket. Interestingly, it looks like Rain's face is now scarred from Bellos' evil sludge just like Hunter's. But the cutest part of Rain's appearance is the fact that they're wearing a pair of Ida's earrings. A few frames later, we actually see Ida wearing Rain's earrings as well. So my question is, is this the witch version of engagement rings? Do you just swap earrings with the person you love in the demon realm? If so, that is super adorable and I'm 200% here for it. We finally get to see Rain's palisman in this scene, and it's an adorable little fox. I wonder if Hunter carved it for them, or if their palisman was hidden with the Bat Queen so that they wouldn't get turned into a protein shake for Bellows during Rain's tenure as the Bard Covenhead. And just a quick little recommendation, we recently put out a video speculating on what the rest of the former Covenhead's palisman might be, so you should totally check it out! Across the aisles, we see a Slither Beast and her cub playing in the snow at the knee, as well as a Selkie Damas and her pup. As the aisles heal, its scenery has only grown more beautiful. There's now a large tree growing out of the Titan's chest, right where Bellos' castle and the Titan's heart used to stand. And the teachers and students at the University of Wild Magic became its new residence. The first professor we see is Edric, who summons a Cyclops bat for a group of students that I suspect also might be modeled after a couple of TOH crew members. Next, we see the keeper of the Looking Glass Graveyard giving a lecture about Galder Stones. Gus is now the proud leader of the Demon Realm Human Realm Exchange Program, teaching witches all about paper clips and other wondrous human artifacts before sending them out into Gravesfield. And yes, that paperclip is definitely a callback to the Human Appreciation Society from Something Ventured Someone Framed. In the next scene, we get a better look at Gus's flapjack ankle tattoo, too. Outside of Headmaster Ida's office, we see two of V's escaped basilisk siblings from yesterday's lie relaxing with a loot on the branches outside. Over here is the screaming alarm bell from Hexide, and the entryway is decorated with framed pictures of Rain, Luz, and King. Inside her office, there's the hanging portrait of the Owl House family, as well as a pic of Ida and Lilith as teenagers on the Grudgeby field. If you blink, however, you might miss that there's even Ida, Albert, and King's Wanted poster from Season 1 hanging directly behind her. A light glyph can be seen at the top of Ida's doorway, a little reminder of how far our witchy family has come. Ida also got a hook hand since the last time we saw her, which is inarguably rad. She is serving Captain Hook looks, and we love to see it. Next up, 
Party planner King is seen wearing a collar with the initials KC for King Clawthorn. He's thrown a surprise 18th King Senyera shindig to make up for the fact that Luz spent her last three birthdays helping to rebuild the Isles. All of the homies have turned up for the occasion, and I love that the former members of Bards Against the Throne don't seem to have changed much about their appearances since the last time we saw them. Mythalamule, the eyeball-eating kid, a ratworm, and Salty have rigged a pain yada using Hootie's long, terrifying body and a dangling snackleback. This poor guy has gone from being a snack for the Albies to a Grom disco ball to a pinata. The Bat Queen's children present Luz with a handmade purple demon claw ball gown, featuring spiderweb accents, a garland made of teeth, and a finger bow tie, delicately placed by the Echo Mouse. This little moment parodies the work song scene from Cinderella when the future princess's bird and mouse friend stitched together her first dress for the prince's ball. Furthering the surprise, King shows Luz that he's now able to cast his own version of the light glyph. The final shot of the series is absolutely perfect, as the entirety of the Isles says the classic Clawthorn family bye to the audience. In our last ever Hexide yearbook photo, we see Viney and her best buddy Puddles with what looks like Puddles' parent, Basha, Willow's dads Gilbert and Harvey, Salty, the Bat Queen and her three kids, Steve, Principal Bump, the Bats, Amber, Derwin, Katya, and Rain, Ida and Albert, Luz, Gus and Emmeline, Willow and Clover, Hunter and Waffles, Skara, Fairies, Del and Gwendolyn Clawthorn, Lilith, Hootie, Camilla, Amity and Ghost, V, Tiny Nose, The Snaggleback, Edric and Emera, Mytholomule, Harry Porter, Alidor Blight, Darius, Eberwolf, Barkus, Gerbo, Tibbles, Morton, The Ratworms, and the Eyeball Eater Kid from the Conformatorium in Episode 1. This series has meant so much to me, and I know how much it's meant to all of you too. Those are just some of the Easter eggs and cool details that I found in the epilogue, but I want to know what I missed in the comments. Like I said up top, we'll be doing a bigger breakdown of the full episode later this week, so make sure you're subscribed to stay tuned. I'm Scarlet Wit, and you're watching Whitney Vision. Bye!